Um, all right, I want to introduce our next presentation. I'm really excited about this one. We have the, the media artist and director, Rafiq Anadol, who um, makes these marvelous site-specific, uh, data-rich installations, uh, really pioneering the aesthetics of machine intelligence. I was lucky enough to see one of his pieces in Los Angeles recently, a hugely ambitious work called WDCH Dreams, which uh, took all of the visual archives of the Los Angeles Philharmonic, 45 terabytes of data, and kind of hallucinated those memories onto the outside of the Walt Disney concert hall in LA. It was really magnificent. Um, Rafik is going to talk about his own work for 15 minutes or so, and then he'll be joined by Manchester International Festival's John McGrath for a conversation about virtual architecture and how buildings can think and dream. Please join me in welcoming Rafik Anadol. <laughs> Good afternoon. I'm super excited and, and very happy to be here with wonderful minds. And I mean, Rafael is going to hammer one of my hero, and um, and uh, many many incredible minds in this festival. So, in um, very quickly in 15 minutes, I have an exciting journey to share with you. I'm Rafik Andol. I'm a media artist uh, living and working in Los Angeles, and also teaching at University of um, California, Los Angeles. Last five years, where I got my second degree. Uh, I'm originally from Istanbul, Turkey, and um, for me, one of the wonderful city that inspiration like coming from for many years, like where West and East, left and right, arabesque and contemporary, everything can be found in this city. And maybe you already like read this very interesting uh, news that it's like the city is very like uh, living its own momentum in many different layers. So one of the most exciting things happened, I was like very cliche, maybe about eight years old, watched this beautiful movie from Ridley Scott, Blade Runner, uh, without knowing English, but the same year, my mother was very luckily, uh, brought me my very first computer, and the rest is like pretty much like living a beautiful uh, imaginations in a very like a young ages. So I struck with like the light as a material, and last um, almost nine years, I'm trying to follow my passion and try to embed media arts into architecture by using data as a substance. But today I want to like talk about a little bit more like how this is like very critically context of technology like transforming our life and how actually we are becoming these new kind of entities that are like following this this these new machines that are like doing our own interesting dreams. Also like very like interested in this idea of sense of displacement. Like how actually we are in stuck in this new universe that I'm not sure if we'll truly capture it. But what does it mean to be like truly like feel the physical and virtual world? But probably the big question is like what does it really mean to be a human in the 21st century. Like this, this uh, creature literally beautifully learned how to use Instagram in less than two minutes. You know, like literally questioning like many of us, I think, like how actually humans, mission and environments can become a new kind of a narrative. So to make this dream happen, last um, five years, this beautiful group of people and I together uh, transforming these questions. And actually, how we can use technology in a way that is just beyond only just a negative world of like thinking, but how we can apply these ideas to build environments by combining physical and virtual worlds. So last four years is really like a very rewarding, and I have been like doing many projects and trying to visualize data sets all over the world, and mostly try to focus on public art projects, meaning try to make things for public means like there is sometimes no door, there is no exit, there is no ceiling, like the time and space is kind of very different. But three years ago, something really exciting happened. And as you may know that like, of course, the tech giants are constantly transforming their landscape of technology. Um, Artists and Machine Intelligence Group is from uh, Google, actually. And it's very excitingly, uh, Blaise Aguirre Arcas, uh, one of the lead engineer, found this uh, exciting group to let the engineers collaborate with artists to like, ask big questions or like, let artists to learn how to use machine intelligence in their practice. 
Kenrick McDowell was one of the um, wonderful minds who allowed me and my team to like join them and, and push the boundaries of machine learning algorithms. And Blaze is like very, I think, uh, as like many of us can imagine, it clearly the machine intelligence is profoundly transforming art as a landscape, like the other technologies transform other mediums. But when we say Google and like, you know, AI and like all this um, knowledge that is driven by thousands of genius minds, I always remember like this project, like, right, like the Google Glass, like how the Google was in a, like envisioning this machine with like very like uh, fashionable and things. But actually, what happened was this, right? Like the, the distance between um, how they imagine and like how it was actually transform us was really like something else. And also like this beautiful panel was clearly like talking about this. If you read that. <laughs> so. So in, 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 in all this like, critical thinking, I was just thinking like, okay, what, what, what else we could do in this context? So I, I took my very childish imagination. I was always like, uh, imagining like, this library as like, a fantastically this imagination space. And the, my challenge for me, like, how can I invent the picture of a library? Like, when you go to a library, how do you know what is exactly there? Like, what will happen if there is no search bar? Like, this is very like, a fundamental thinking behind those tools. So um, me and my team quickly we design an immersive room where you can go follow like, a path of a, like, a corridor, and at the end you land in a room where the circular room is kind of representing the infinite effect of the, of the um, uh, library. There's four channel projection and interactive tablet. So we've collaborated with a wonderful library in Istanbul called SALT, and they have 1.7 million incredible cultural artifacts. And each artifact has a 49 columns of metadata. And also this took them eight years for four research, like four historians deep dive into this cultural archive. Luckily, I was able to get the data in like a two, two and a half, like and a half terabyte of like a raw data, truly like go through the neural network algorithms and like first apply um, machine learning um, um, image recognition algorithms and try to understand what does like exist in that library and even later try to create an hallucination from this archive. So, as far as I know, this project is uh, one of the first um, um, machine intelligence driven public installation people will allow to like explore. And, and for me, what is meaningful is library is one of those places where data turns into a knowledge and information. And, and this kind of this divine place was really exciting to understand like how we can narrate how machine can learn or if it can learn like in a dream like, can we like apply this knowledge to like enhance our cognitive capacity in life it's kind of like very um, maybe maybe questions that that um, potentially enhance our um, imagination so the project was open only four weeks and, and interesting it was just an artwork but turned into a real research tool so people were really like using the tool and the UI that you will see right now literally in real time and try to fly in the mind of a machine to find the patterns that they couldn't find by writing in a search bar. So this interesting idea of like using um, AI in this context was really like um, this science fiction slash a real research project slash like a truly functional library. So like this moment, for example, she's like flying literally uh, in Tiffany universe. Basically, when machine learns, it doesn't need like physical space like us. It can store the information multi-dimensional world. So what was really exciting is when you lower dimension three dimensions, you can clearly see the big picture of the archive and like fly in the mind of a machine and decide your own kind of thing. And this part is like the most like the meta moment. Like when you when nobody is there, the archive is dreaming. Like clearly these are the documents that do not exist. An algorithm called DC again was um, behind the scenes um, that were like creating those imagination documents. Well, this project was like really one of like those uh, projects that truly uh, apply our discipline to learn how to use machine intelligence. And then later on, like um, the, the memory, I think the moment of remembering was another obsession. And I was very lucky to work with UCSF uh, professor Adam Gezeli, and his team was allowing us to use this pretty interesting machine and 32 channel EEG device with a beautiful algorithm that we were able to like classify the moment of remembering without breaching our privacy and just like celebrate such a humanly cognitive uh, capacity of like remembering and take those moments and transform them into a three-dimensional uh, data sculptures. So what was really exciting is once you start to apply narratives to these algorithms and enhance our imagination, it like, truly became like really a new kind of a, a kind of a storytelling tool, I guess. Um, but 
what was really exciting story to share with you is I think is much more get excited um, is like once like these machine learning um, algorithms apply to those, those uh, artistic uh, uh, imaginations, there was much more bigger dream that I was like really trying to make it happen, which was right now the Disney Hall, which is Frank Gehry's beautiful cultural beacon for Los Angeles. So this building is like literally the home of LA Philharmonic last 15 years. In this building, like many beautiful minds and souls performed incredible pieces. And for me as a media artist student, I was like trying to imagine what will happen this building can one day think, learn, remember, or have the cognitive capacity of like dreaming. And if, of course, when you like think about this concept of like dreaming for like an art built environment, LA Philharmonic like, couldn't understand uh, or sorry, couldn't uh, give a purpose or impact without like really a day to celebrate, which was this year is the 100th celebration of Philharmonic Orchestra. So instead of like using fireworks, they decided to like go beyond fireworks and decided to like collaborate and look at their memories. So a, a huge support from, of course, Frank Gehry and the city of Los Angeles. We were able to get 44.5 terabytes of raw memories of the institution. So what does this mean is pretty interesting, because if you look at the data that LA Philharmonic holds, is like first of all almost 77,000 audio recordings. Like if you want to listen every single recording they did, it took, it took like us 17 years. And the secondly, like very interestingly, all the memories that the building holds visually, every photography like shot by before or after events was almost like more than half million images. And also, like every single event they did, also recorded by a video, and which is almost 90,000 individual files. So for me, like what was the biggest challenge was how to create a narrative by using machine learning algorithms and create this like kind of futuristic story in the city of Los Angeles and a gift to the city, free for everyone, a public art installation. So to make it happen, there was like a three chapters that happened in the story. The very first one was memory, like very humanly cognitive, like moment of a machine goes online and look at its patterns. And the second one was consciousness, where the like machines kicks in and look at the, like the patterns of the information that the building holds and classify them based on like the similarities. And the third was like where like the more uh, the childish imagination kicks in with the dream part, and we were like witnessing how the dr uh, building was transforming itself into the, uh, this kind of an entity. But at the end, we learned that the building was trying to remain remember a moment in a given time. To make it happen, if you saw the building, it's like always compound curves with Frank Gehry's like incredible dynamic geometries, meaning we have to find a unique 13 point of interaction with the building and use 42 individual projections to augment the building from multiple angles. And it was a, like a very challenging couple of um, months of just mathematics to make it happen. And later on, we have to use the building in a different way than just a surface. To make it happen, we have to use the original Frank Gehry's uh, a Katia model from 2002 and augment the building by using like retransferring the cut, like the current skin of the building and transform existing like a structure of the building and like later kind of create a new canvas from that. And it was a very like a, a challenging process. And later on, we were able to also touch every single memory of the institution. So we were very lucky that we were have access to 100 years of every single performance have been done. Meaning conductor, composer, uh, musician, the year, date, time of that, even the moment. So basically, every decision that the uh, institution had made last hundred years, but instead of looking at this just like a sunburst algorithm, I was trying to like find like how we can like explore this space that they did the decisions in a third dimension and make kind of an iris for the building that you can fly inside to create this kind of a three-dimensional kind of a space in the mind of a machine. And then later on, of course, like what will happen if an AI goes to like a concert, right? Like what will it see? Like what will it feel? Like what, what can it like understand? Our collaboration with Google Arts and Culture allow us to like use one of the probably most interestingly heavy models that can literally look at these patterns of information. So we simply get these um, more than half million images of the memories of the LA Philharmonic and look at those patterns from the same algorithm. It's called VGG16. And what was really exciting is once you apply this, this algorithm to this, this vast amount of information, we were able to create those three-dimensional data sculptures. Those three-dimensional, like, literally patterns of memory um, and designed by the similarities of their, like, uh, happenings. And then take this substance as a light and attach to the building later as a story um, in, in the next steps, which we can see here. 
And this allowed us to like create those data sculptures and like in three dimensions. And also for the audio recordings, we were able to like create the seven terabytes of raw audio data and classify them by 256 individual attributes. And at the end, we were able to like uh, literally create this data universe that you can touch every single moment of 100 years of recordings. And lastly, which was very, I think, exciting, like how a building can dream. Like what, would it, what does it mean to like to, for a building to dream even like? So very like a meta contest, like what will happen if the building goes online one night and download every single images exist in the social network, from Flickr, Instagram, to Google Images. So to make it happen, we literally like download every single image that we could find by the hashtag of the building and create again an algorithm that was like looking at these patterns and create those dreams from, from the same um, memories of the building. Like it's kind of the selfie of the machine or the building that is looking at like how the people were looking at self. And the music you are hearing is a beautiful collaboration with Robert Thomas, Kirim Karol, and Parag Mittal, and it's all machine hallucination. So what you hear and what you see is simply uh, like a machine alteration of reality based on the archive uh, of, the, of the moments. And then these dreams later on like get colorized and at the end attached to the building as a substance. So if you give me uh, three more minutes, I have a special video that shows the performance, and I got a par um, approval from LA Philharmonic to show you this three minutes short video if you allow me to show. Um, and we can open the sound more um, for, for the next video. It's only three minutes. It's the last part, the dream part.
you. And thank you very much. And, and the most like important part, maybe the Frank Gehry part, because he was uh, truly like also dreaming a similar idea. He was trying to use the canvas of the building as like a, a canvas and project onto it. And I think he, having seen him like very um, happy was a very meaningful moment. And thank you very much. And happy to get your questions and like get the uh, um, information. Thank you. <laughs> I'm two minutes late. <laughs> Thank you, Rafik. That Thank was a completely thrilling journey through the dream of a building and the dream of an artist. I've got loads of questions, but I think it would be unfair to start with mine because after such a high-speed and informative <laughs> visionary presentation, I'm sure that people um, in the audience will have things that they'd love to ask. So um, let's throw it open to you guys right away. First person to wave at me. I know you're out there. If you don't, I'm going to nick the spot. <laughs> OK, I've got a question then. Yeah. Um, uh, as you know, Rafiq, um, we're involved in creating a, a, a building ourselves with um, the architects Alan Van Loon and, and Rem Coolhouse, uh, which is going to be called The Factory. Um, and um, it's about a couple of years away from completion. You see some steel and concrete on the site at the moment. So at the moment, it exists as a dream. Yeah. Um, but it also exists as a set of data. And in fact, you know, in many ways, the building is built yeah. through the data that's been generated. And all that's left is to um, realize that yes. in, in physical form. And I wondered what you, as someone who talks very much about architecture and data, what has been in your um, involvement in the processes of architecture and the creation of buildings and how you think the work that you do and our relationship now to data transforms the possibilities of the architectural process itself. Yeah, so, so, so it's a wonderful uh, point that, as you mentioned, like, first of all, the building is incredibly like an exciting canvas, and I've, I mean, I'm pretty sure it'll transform the city and its context. And what is really exciting is once, like, for example, in this context, Frank Gehry was already like, uh, and LA Philharmonic, and so, like, they were like dreaming about this building for many years and all funding, and there's a really like a very um, uh, heavy process of like first making a physical dr virtual dream into a physical world. Um, sometimes very in our other collaborations, an artwork can be an add-on, mm -hmm. which is a, a why not? But sometimes collaborations starts very earlier and then it turns into a more cohesive, kind of a more natural engagement of an idea that doesn't feel eclectic. Mm -hmm. um, and I think w what is really exciting is once the canvas and the architecture allows an imagination that is already has a sprinkle during the process of building it, I think it feels more natural, um, which more magic projects are more like firing around those moments. And when we're talking about data, like of course being very critical about what data means and who controls and how it happens, if you look at it from the archival point of view, the memories of the city, memories of the cultural like backgrounds, this information right now is somewhere in the cloud that we cannot touch, right? We cannot like search, we cannot like feel it, but we know it's there. And maybe like the new purpose of built environments has a whole new cognitive capacity that allow anyone from any age, any background, go and feel and touch something fresh mm -hmm. that is already there in the past, mm. but never visualized. This kind of, I think, serendipitic moments may happen mm. thanks to these unique new imagination collaborations. Mm. And, and one of the um, images you showed there, of course, was at Borges' library. And the, um, the, in some ways, I think even just a few years ago, the idea of the library and the idea of the archive felt like a, a dream of the past, mm -hmm. felt like something that, that maybe we were almost beyond and we were in the, the world of perpetually present information. But somehow the archive and the library is, is coming back with a, with a glorious vengeance now. And do you want to talk a little bit yes. about your, your relationship to that, to, you know, to, to, to that image of Borges and yeah. the library as a dream, but also um, the, the creation of archives that you're very involved yeah. in? So I think, again, like Borges and, and, and a similar um, um, thinkers or writers who have been like dreaming about accessing information or knowledge and like trying to like dream these this, this, this landscapes it was always like a very personal, I think, inspiration. Uh, and also like, I mean, probably like many, many of us who like research, like going to a library and, and, and like smell of a book or like the environment that where you like 
dive into your ideas and dreams. It's just, a, I think, a very divine place that I hope it's the future of, like, um, the humanity maybe, like, mm. lies in that environment. So it's, like, coming from there. Mm. And, and AI in this context is, like, really strong, powerful um, uh, a technology that is, yes, like, we can, like, the, how we find, the, when we find the fire, we cook with it, we make guns with it. It's the same idea, like, what, what can we do with AI is much exciting than just, I think, losing time for also negativity. So I took the, like, kind of a, a purposeful approach there, and once you apply a very commonly known image recognition algorithms, mm -hmm. the archive itself becomes more visible. Like mm -hmm. making that invisible world of knowledge visible is now very doable. Uh, even you can go like one step further, do virtual reality environments, mm -hmm. which you can dive into machines' mind. Um, like it's a the, 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 the ideas that lies in mission intelligence is really very, very diverse. Um, to just see that, like just to look at the edge of that technology, we just thought we should dive into that like um, water without knowing where it starts and ends. Mm. Um, but I'm very clearly say that I hope like the future of our libraries and, and archives um, beyond just Google search, mm. beyond just like an image search, I think we can be much more smart mm -hmm. than to ask the not the not to dive into just or stuck in hashtag culture, go beyond that world and find that connections with these built environments can be maybe much exciting for next generations. Great. I could keep asking questions all afternoon, but I'm going to give you guys one last chance. There you go. Yep, thank you. Um, there are lots, uh, there are and there were lots of uh, buildings which had um, historical uh, architectural importance which told the stories of the communities which were suppressed or underrepresented. But those buildings were demolished or are demolished and will be demolished because there is lack of knowledge about this um, importance they play. There is lack of uh, awareness, there is lack of narrators who can tell the story of these buildings or lack of advocacy. And I see that what are you doing and your skills, your knowledge, and I would rather say your genius can actually help here. But I'm just wondering, it looks like very expensive. So how, <laughs> so how, how can we bring uh, your genius and the genius of your colleagues uh, to uh, help to stop this uh, challenge of losing these important buildings and stories behind? Oh, I mean, them. For, thank you very much, first yes. of all, and happy to be involved. I mean, very openly saying, LA Flamonic is a non-profit organization. Archive Dreaming done for a non-profit organization called SALT, part of LA International. So first of all, there, um, it's not about funding, but about like motivation and imagination and collaboration together, I guess. Because then, when that happens, that synergy brings purposeful and impactful projects. So first of all, I think that's the algorithm from the heart that, that works much better. But I think your, your topic and your point is incredibly important, and especially like in the heritage or like the memory in like Raphael's also concept. Like it's really very, probably the most nostalgic humanly cognitive capacity that we should hold <laughs> than letting machines to like steal our dreams, memories, or comments, or likes, or shares. So I think it's a very, um, deeply important topic to be a part of in any scale, in any capacity, shortly, that all my team in Los Angeles is excited to be a part of any purposeful projects like that. Uh, one last question. Yeah, we'll go with the, the first hand to raise, sorry. Uh, we've got time for just one more. Uh, um, so I was wondering what, whether you would consider doing something similar for um, like artifacts in museums, because I hear lots that uh, like th within the um, context of like conservation, that lots of artifacts or lots of pieces that are on display in museums aren't actually, aren't necessarily the real things because the real things are too fragile so they have to be um, sort of kept in vaults or whatever, or perhaps they're not available in their indigenous country of origin. So in the cases of say, British museums taking Egyptian artifacts or, or similarly, um, do you think that your kind of work has a place within the museum and the conservation sort of, um, world? 
I, I think it's a wonderful point. Uh, we have now two research going on in a very high level, but uh, one of the reasons that we are like diving in that and heritage uh, data sets um, is like trying to find the context of physicality and how we can bring and preserve the physicality quali physical quality of an object without being gimmicky with the tools that we know available, such as like AR, VR tools. I think there's still a beautiful um, substance in between those toys and the reality. <laughs> so we're like trying to find that, that, that magical um, instrument that can maybe re recollect or reconstruct that feeling. Um, like transforming like maybe immersive environments and try to like maybe use even substance in the air to like create not hologram but similar ideas um, or even trying to like um, create this um, machine that can reconstruct from a given point cloud data and similar like that so but there's a huge research also going on in the AI community that is like they are trying to like use the data sets to reconstruct some physical reality as well but a very I think important research area that can be very deep to focus. Rafiq, this has been fascinating. And I know that people have a bunch more questions now. Um, you. So are you around at the end if, yes. if people want to chat a bit more? Yes, so so please be. do talk to yeah. Rafiq. I'm um, here, and my wife also is here. Like, if any of us are, like, we are happy to be in a dialogue anytime. Great. And, and as I'm sure everyone's aware, this is a huge collaborative yes. effort. So yes. um, talking to, yeah. to the wider team will yeah. be really useful. Yeah. Um, just to note, before we move on, that there are um, other opportunities to interact with work through the afternoon and after the sessions today. Um, so I knew that um, Hardeep Pandal, who of course was on a panel this morning and created these extraordinary lenticular structures, will also, I think, still be around if people would like to chat to him. And I believe it will also be possible to wander onto the stage um, and have a look at them more closely if you want to um, see how they, they work from different perspectives. Um, so maybe just jump on the stage at the end and if if that wasn't true, um, <laughs> people will tell you to jump off. Um, uh, also, um, there will be an opportunity to play with um, Paloma, Paloma Dawkins's game um, Commission for MIF-19, um, Songs of the Lost. Of course, you can also go home and play that on your home computers and laptops as well, but it is available here to interact with. Um, the RSC, as you heard from Sarah earlier, have been um, working a lot with Magic Leap, and they have a virtual reality experience, and for, I, I know that Magic Leap is becoming more and more um, uh, available, but for those who haven't yet had an opportunity to experience that technology, this is a really nice um, introduction into that world. Um, and I believe there is also so a Google Glass version of a 360 view of the factory dream, I, what we imagine it will be look like when it's built, and that's also available around about in the spaces of home. So do stick with us um, for the upcoming discussions, which I know are going to be um, just as fantastic as Rafiq's, but also if you get an opportunity to stick around afterwards and interact with some of those experiences, that would be fabulous too. But for now, thank you very much, you very much. and we'll thank move you. on to the next session. Thank you.